Well, the Eagles are two and five, and we're still kind of sorting through the rubble from another loss. This is the Eagle Eye Podcast presented by Nissan with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. Rube, how are you? I believe that's the fourth time in the last five weeks you've used the phrase sorting through the rubble. And it's Yeah, it won't be the last time. Mostly. An appropriate one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm we have a ready, <laughs> ready ready to attack the podcast. Yeah, it is funny. It's October. It's you know, we're recording this on October 26th. And a lot of the big picture questions that we're already asking are really like questions that you thought you wait until November, December to get to, but that's how bad things have gotten for this team. And maybe they'll get better, but that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah. And uh, they brought that on the coaching steps, brought that on themselves. They put themselves in a position where it's fair to wonder if they're overmatched, if they're um, the right people for the job, if there's a possibility to be one and done. These are all fair questions that a month and a half ago, I never would have thought we'd be asking, but um, it's bad. I mean, they've, they've trailed by 12 or more points in six straight games. They've trailed by 19 or more points at some point in four straight games. They're just not competitive right now. And I think guys are playing hard, but um, they're just a really, really bad football team. Other than, you know, the end of the Carolina game, um, they, you know, they had a nice comeback. Um I mean, they've done nothing since opening day. Uh, a couple of big fourth quarters when they were down 25 points, big, big deal. Um, it's been uh, it's been really ugly for most of the last, pretty much virtually all of the last six games. Yeah, that's the thing. It, losing games is one thing. Getting embarrassed week in and week out is another. And if there's one thing we know Jeff Lurie doesn't like, he doesn't like to be the butt of a joke. He doesn't like to be embarrassed on big stages. So yeah, I think all these questions are fair. We have a lot to get to today. Uh, we want to talk about Jonathan Gannon. He had a chance to respond to a lot of the criticism he's faced. Uh, Nick Sirianni had another press conference since last time we spoke, a press conference that got delayed quite a bit. And uh, with that extra time, didn't make it any better. Should have uh, been Joe delayed Flacco, forever. Yeah. Joe Flacco got traded. Gardner Minshew is the backup. So we'll get into all the repercussions of that trade. And then at the end, we'll kind of bat around some other players who might be tradable. You know, if this team ends up being sellers at the deadline, which they've already traded two veterans away, seems possible. So uh, a lot to get to, but we want to start with Jonathan Gannon. Kind of the big news of Tuesday was that he had a chance to speak for the first time since the game. Let me rephrase that. He spoke for the first time since the game because there's no rule that says he had to wait. So, um, well, the Brett Strosacker rule says he has to wait. Yeah, the, the Eagles public relations department doesn't want the defensive coordinator to speak after games, and he hasn't. So, um, we waited until Tuesday. And what did you make of, of a lot of the, the things he said? He was, I, I thought. Uh, good job by the beat core in general, getting to just about every question I thought he, he needed to be asked. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's Jonathan Gannon makes a lot of sense when he speaks. And that's been the case since he got here. I mean, he's um, he's articulate. He's he, he's um, he listens to the questions. He's thoughtful. Um, and his answers make sense. It's just nothing changes. <laughs> it's like they still, you know, give up, you know, 30 points a game and let quarterbacks complete 80% of their passes just about every week. So um, I, I like what he says. I mean, I thought the, you know, he was presented with Fletcher's comments post game and his frustration. And he said, well, you know, Fletcher made some good points and it seems to be a little disconnect because Fletcher says it's not his job to talk to the coaches, but Nick said he's talked to Fletcher and Gannon, Gannon. said, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. But they both said that. Yeah, Nick said. Oh, yeah, Nick said that on on the uh, morning show to um, early Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. He said that he spoke to Fletcher, and Gannon spoke to him. So, um, you know, they. I mean, look, it makes sense that they they want to know what each player is most comfortable doing and what they want to do, and see if that fits into um, how they want to play. And um, Gannon seems to be open to listening to players, especially 
a guy like Fletcher who's an all-time great eagle. Um, so it makes it makes sense, but is anything going to change is, is the question. I mean, Gannon, every time I've spoken to Gannon or listened to him, he's made perfect sense. And I come away thinking, this guy really knows his stuff. And then you watch on Sunday, and it's like, what, what are we watching here? So, um, you know, a lot of times it's the other way around where the, the coordinator doesn't really say much, but then, you know, like they play really well. Um so I don't know. I don't know what to think. Um, Gannon seemed to be responsive and, and respectful. And, and, you know, I thought he responded the right way to Fletch, but it, whether anything will change, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was uh, noteworthy, I thought, that he was presented with what Nick Sirianni said about there being a need for the defense to challenge more. And Gannon said, well, that came from me. I said it to him as we walked off the field that, Basically, when the ball, he, I, I'm paraphrasing, but when the ball doesn't touch the ground, it's tough to win. What he means by that is Derek Carr completed 31 of 34 passes, and the Eagles just weren't competitive defensively. But we saw that during the game. You're allowed to change during the game. You're allowed to be a little more inventive and creative on the fly. And after watching other quarterbacks do this to you, the idea that you couldn't change midstream in this game just doesn't make any sense. And my, my thing with Gannon is what's the, what's the downside to changing things? You're already awful. You're giving up what? 32.4 points per game in the last five weeks. Six, so six, yeah. if you challenge them and they beat you over the top, at least that would give Gannon the ammo to be like, look, this is what you want me to do. It didn't work. But with him just doing the same thing over and over and it not working, it makes him look either completely clueless or really stubborn. And I don't want either of those qualities in a defensive coordinator. Yeah, that was my takeaway as well. Like if – I mean, can't you tell that they're – every single pass is getting caught by a receiver? Like, I mean – do you have to really wait until after the game or on Monday watching film to say, maybe we should cover these guys a little tighter, especially after Mahomes, Brady, and um, and and uh, Dak all did the same thing. They were all over 80%. The Eagles are already the first team in NFL history to allow four quarterbacks to complete 80% of their passes, and it's week seven. Yeah. just half a season to go. And look, I get his point. And he even made the point again on Tuesday that, look, sometimes – the completion percentage doesn't bother us as much if, if it's not leading to winning plays from the other team, but it is. Yeah. Which I get, look, look, if, if every pass they complete is for four yards and they complete 80%, I get it. That's not a big deal. You can live with that, but that's sure. not what's happening here. And I think what's most frustrating about Jonathan Gannon is that he has good ideas but these ideas don't fit with what he has personnel-wise. They just don't. Yeah. If, this if you're going to play this passive style of defense, you better have linebackers. And if there's one inefficiency, if there's one major glaring weakness on this defense, it's the linebackers. Yeah. So it's just inexcusable for me to, to watch him trot out this defense without linebackers and be surprised by the results because – a four-yard pass goes for 12 against this defense, and that's happened consistently over the last month. This defense works if you are a very good tackling team and you're a good pressure team, which at times they have been, but at times they haven't been. Um, and if you're, um, you know, if you're really good on third down, and, and that kind of goes into tackling. I mean, I don't know how many times we've seen a short pass miss tackle and move the sticks. Um, if they were tackling better, uh, you can play this style. And there's something to be said for not giving up big plays. And they still gave up the one um, <laughs> on that third and 15 or whatever it was. But um, for the most part, they haven't given up big plays. So in theory, that's great. Don't give up. Put, keep everything in front of us. Make tackles. Get, get them off the field. But that part isn't getting done. And there's nothing – that I've seen to make me think it will. They don't have the players to do it. They don't like, like you said, they don't have the personnel 
to, to get the defense off the field unless the quarterback just flat out makes a mistake. Now, they faced four of the best quarterbacks in football. I mean, three, you know, Dak, Mahomes, and, and Brady are, you know, three of the best. Um, things should should get easier. I mean, they faced Justin Herbert and then Dak at the end of the year, if, if Dallas is even playing their starters at that point. But um, things should get easier, and I'm really curious to see if if it looks like it did Sunday and the previous Thursday or if it makes a difference. Um, look, in this league, you're facing a lot of elite quarterbacks, no matter what your schedule looks like. You're facing a bunch of them. So um, you can't give up 30 points every time you, you play them. But um, I think Detroit will be, you know, Detroit will be a, a really interesting game from that standpoint. The Lions aren't scoring any points. I don't think they've scored 20 since opening day. Uh, I've never been a, um, a, a Jared Goff fan, and he's now in a worse situation, certainly by far, than he was with the with the Rams. Um so it's a team that, you know, they should hold under 20 points, you know, and if Detroit comes out and scores 30 on them, 28, 32, then that's, I think it's a really interesting test from that standpoint. Um, a can, can get an adjust B does some version of his scheme work against a lesser quarterback. It worked against Garoppolo. It worked against Matt Ryan. It worked against Darnold. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, they've, there's really, they faced, you know, four really good quarterbacks and three average to below average ones, and they've played accordingly each week. So um, they need, I mean, look, they need to win a game. If they, if they lose to a winless 0 7 Lions team, they lose to Dan Campbell. Um, then the next Sirianni, Jonathan Gannon watch is going to be on officially because. You're going to be two and six. You're going to be one and six in your last seven games. And you just lost to a winless team with a rookie coach that's never won a game. Uh, that hasn't scored more than 17 points or 19 points since the opener. Um, it's a big game. It's a big game, especially for Gannon and his group. Yeah. I mean, if, if they lose this game, you think that things are bad in this city now for Nick Sirianni and Jonathan Gannon. It, it would be – it would be very bad. And if you can't beat the Lions, who can you beat? Exactly. And, that's, and at least they've been competitive. They've been in these games. They gave the Rams all they could handle for a little while last week. But they're not a very good team, obviously. They're 0-6, 0-7. 0-7. Yeah, so this is a game they should win. The Eagles are favored early in this one. That tells you how bad the Lions are. <laughs> yeah, it does. And I like, also like your point about the quarterbacks they've faced because you could also argue, yeah, maybe Gannon's going to change some things, but you can also question how much he needs to change from this point on right. because there's going to be some natural regression to the mean with the quarterbacks they face from here on out. So, yeah, you you wish they would have changed for this last game because that's when they needed it. That's when they needed it against a quarterback like Derek Carr, who is smart enough and in rhythm enough to get the ball out quickly, to take what he gives you and to move down the field on them like he did. So I, I've just been really disappointed with Jonathan Gannon. I, and you and I both really thought highly of him when they got him talk to talk. And it wasn't like, you know, when they hired Nick Sirianni, a lot of people thought, well, they're hiring a puppet or they're hiring this outside the box guy. No one else was lining up to even interview Nick Sirianni. He didn't have another interview when the Eagles hired him. But Jonathan Gannon, by all accounts, would have been a defensive coordinator somewhere. You yeah. Know? And he was pretty sought after. When you look at his resume and you look at his where he's been, who he's coached. Uh, the product he's put on the field. I mean, he's got a good resume and it wasn't a out of the box hire. It wasn't a, um, you know, ridiculous kind of off the wall. Um, let's try to invent a guy here. I mean, he was, um, he, he has a really good resume, really good background. I, I really, I love the hire when they made it. I don't understand why he's this bad and why he's been this slow to adjust and why he's this, like you said, either. I, I think it's, Gosh, I don't know. I guess it's stubbornness. I, I don't usually buy stubborn. People say guys are stubborn. I mean, I, I like to think they believe in in what they do. Um, but gosh, but he doesn't have a scheme, Rube. 
He oh, told us right. he do, he doesn't right. have a scheme, and he's gonna he's going to fit it to his players, and he hasn't done that. He's no, done the no. opposite of it. And honestly, it even makes you question some of the offseason moves. You know, like why bring in Ryan Kerrigan if you're going to use him in this way? And I don't know if he has anything left, but uh, and I, I thought, you know, Gannon was asked some really important questions. A lot of these, you know, the three man fronts, they don't have the personnel to run them. They just don't. And they're playing guys out of position. And there's something to be said. Sometimes it takes a while for a new staff to get the personnel in place that they want. But after all this talk about fitting your schemes to your players to then do the opposite of it is mind numbing to me. Yeah. Really disappointing. Um, be interesting to see what happens from here on out and how much he, he changes. Um, yeah. But I mean, look, I, I like, I like Jonathan Gannon and I was impressed with him from day one, but um, I, gosh, I mean, you have to be, you know, not paying attention to not really wonder if he's, he just either wasn't ready. He's in over his head. He misjudged how hard it was. And I think these guys put the time in. I mean, they, they all work long hours. They all, you know, do all the things you have to do, but he, there's just a disconnect somewhere between everything they say and everything that they, you know, prepare for. And then what we see on Sundays or Thursdays, it, it's, it's really weird. You know, like people ask me about uh, compare Kotite with, with Sirianni and Kotite. I mean, Kotite, we knew he was a buffoon. It took a couple of years before, uh, you know, it was, it was obvious once, once Buddy's players were gone, but he was a buffoon and we knew it was going to blow up and it did. Um, these guys, especially, especially JG, but Nick also to an extent, I mean, they, they say the right things other than dog mentality. I don't ever need to hear that phrase again, but they seem to know football. They seem to be really good X and O guys. They seem to have earned the respect of their players when they got here. I'm not sure it's all still at the same level, um, but then we just, just don't see the product out there and we don't see adjustments and we don't see, I mean, they, they've both been terrible. They've just both been terrible. And I've been really surprised by that, more so by, by JG, but by both, by both sides of the ball. Yeah, I mean, I thought Nick would have. I thought Nick would have a real flair for play calling, and he's been, for the most part, he's been awful. Yeah, well, if he hasn't called plays well, he has that dog mentality, and he'll forget about it. And uh, speaking of dog mentality, I do want to talk about his press conference on end up being Monday night. Uh, pretty late because of the Joe Flacco trade, they didn't want to trot him up there before that was finalized. So. It ended up. It was. It, it was certainly a lot of intrigue. It, it made people kind of wonder. It was was originally scheduled for four forty five on Monday. Then they moved it to five thirty. Six o'clock rolled around. When did it start? Like six thirty. I don't even know. I think it was later than that. Um, but all I know is that I was on a flight from Ve- well from Dallas from Vegas, and I thought I'd be able to listen to it on the flight. Well, I the flight landed. I was furiously like checking my phone. I didn't want to miss it. I deplaned. I found a spot in the terminal and just waited, just waited for another hour. And, and the payoff wasn't great because if, if folks listened to that presser, I don't think they left feeling any more confident in Nick Sirianni. Yeah, it was, um, it was embarrassing. Let's be honest. It was embarrassing. And, you know, you start talking about doubling down on dog mentality and, and the connection and, you know, compete and just, it just these are cliches. They're, they're empty, they're empty, meaningless words and phrases. Um, and I think people want to hear specifics of what are we going to do to get better as far as protection and running the ball and quarterback being more accurate and uh, people want to hear specifics. How, how are you going to get better? They don't want to hear these high school, high school Harry phrases. And I mean, at some point, look, I, I think this team's still playing hard, which reflects on Nick's relationship with the team. But at some point, I mean, that stuff, you know, veteran players, man, they keep hearing that same thing, you know, that we, we're hearing like, I mean, we've heard 
these phrases forever and they lose their meaning. Like you come in as a new coach and you throw this stuff around say, yeah, hits principle. Yeah. Connecting, you know, but then you start hearing the same things every day in every meeting and every press conference. And it just loses its meaning and loses its value. And I don't ever need to, need to hear the phrase dog mentality again. It's, it's embarrassing. He embarrasses himself when he does that stuff. And um, I just wonder what the team thinks when they keep hearing it. Yeah, and I understand his idea of doubling down on the things he believes in in times of adversity. I get that. But you can't just believe in mantras. You have to believe in things that work. And it's – You can't if you want it in, in mantras. Yeah. In the That's back good. of your mind, if you think – that this, you know, dogma, whatever it is, if you believe in it, that's fine. But you can't just keep saying it. You just can't keep saying it. It's, it's, it's that dog mentality is going to go down next to, to gold standard and all those other stupid sayings that have been trotted out in front of Philadelphia for years. And it's a shame because at its base, like I get what he's saying. He's saying the results don't necessarily mean that the process is broken. And I think there's some validity into that in, in that because he's gotten to this point in his career for a certain reason. You know, he's been a good coach to get at some level to become a head coach. So he has to believe in certain principles, right? But I agree with you, like all this mantra crap missed me with it. I'm done with it. And if we're done with it, I can't imagine what the players are thinking losing what for their last five and, and Nick's, Nick's up there. Knicks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Nick's up there talking about dog mentality. I mean, and you know, he's doing it in the meetings. I mean, he's going to lose the team. I'm telling you, he's going to lose the team if, if he doesn't cut that stuff out. And I'm, I'm surprised somebody hasn't advised him of that or, you know, but you're right. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, we still, when we talk about coat tech, we still talk about no cookbook answers was his, what well, that was his thing. You know, Rich, you guys have lost seven in a row. Oh, there's no cookbook answers. That was his little slogan. Every, every coach is, I mean, big red had a couple of them, you know, uh, I got to put him in better positions. You know, like he said that a thousand times over 14 years, I just got to put guys in better positions to make plays. Um, what was chips? Yeah, a few big people beat up little people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they – I'm. It, it's – it's. I mean, look, we, we make fun of them and, and all that, but it's really, really disappointing in, in the big picture. It's not – I don't think – I mean, we have fun with it, but it's not funny. Um, it's, it's, it's just disappointing and kind of sad to me to – you know, you're, you're not at Mount Union anymore. You know, you're, you're, this is, this is the big leagues and that stuff doesn't work. Yeah. I, I, the one other thing I wanted to bring up from his presser was it seems like either he realized how it came off post game or someone told him how it came off post game because he didn't necessarily walk back the criticism of the defense, but he tried to make it clear and it, I don't know if it worked that he wasn't criticizing Jonathan Gannon um, because he's the head coach and he's in charge of everything. So when he criticizes the defense, he says it starts with him, which look, I get it. He's the head coach and he needs to be accountable for everything that goes wrong. And that includes if the DC is making bonehead decisions because he has the power to, yep. to change it, but it's Gannon's defense. That would be like me saying to you, Dave, you sucked on the podcast Tuesday. But when I say that, I mean, you know, we both did. <laughs> no, yeah, but, but I, I, it's a little different because a, you don't have power over me, whereas Nick has, like, Nick is, yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Uh, but Nick is, is Jonathan's boss. So it, with the last coaching staff, Jim Schwartz had just – overwhelming autonomy on that side of the ball. And, and that was like, it was almost unparalleled autonomy for a defensive coordinator because he had it not just in play call, play design, game plan. He also had it in a lot of personnel. So um, it doesn't seem like Gannon has quite that much, which makes sense. He's a 38-year-old first-time 
defensive coordinator. Jim Schwartz was a former head coach, longtime DC. So you understand the difference. But the one thing I did take away from the Sirianni press conference, he said, if I want to do it this way, we're going to do it this way. Doug never said that. Right. He never needed to either. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you go back and listen to his comments um, after the game, I mean, he was very clearly being critical of, of Jonathan Gannon. And he didn't, I mean, you, you read, I, wrote, I wrote a story about it. The quotes are all in there. It's really clear. He was not talking about himself. Um, there was one point where he said, he, he did say, you know, I have my name on everything with the team, but he, I mean, he singled out Jonathan Gannon by name several times. And so, then even in with, uh, with a one-on-one interview with John Clark, he, he doubled down <laughs> on criticism that time. And he said, we need more possessions offensively. The defense has to get us the ball. Yep. There's no other way to take that. No, that's, uh, yeah, it's pretty clear. Pretty clear. Um, hey, score big with the AAA Eagles MVP membership, along with superb roadside assistance and discounts. We've all come to expect from AAA. Now you get exclusive Eagles-related perks. For all the details, go to AAA.com slash Eagles. So the reason that press conference was pushed back a couple hours was because Joe Flacco got traded to the New York Jets. A conditional six-round pick could turn into a five, uh, depending on playtime. We don't know what the conditions of it are. Found out today, actually, that six-round pick is not the Jets' six-round pick. They didn't have one. It's Tampa Bay's six-round pick, which means it's considerably less valuable. <laughs> It's right. almost a seven at that point. Right. Um, so, you know, you have to hope that, I mean, I would think it'll be based on starts, could be um, could be snaps, but I think those are, they're usually starts in, in that case. Um, you know, maybe if Flacco starts four games, six games, we'll see. We should know soon. Um, I mean, this is, this is vintage Howie is, this is what he's good at. He took a, a minimum wage, um, free agent that didn't cost the Eagles anything and turned it into a draft pick. So not a great draft pick, but. Um, I mean, you, you can know. certainly still question the Joe Flacco signing for how much they paid him. Yeah, that, that's, that's for sure. But I agree uh, with you. This was a, a no brainer move. It's basically like they traded Joe Flacco for Gardner Minshew. Pretty much. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. So Minshew's number two. Um, Flacco came and went without ever playing, without ever getting on the field. Zero snaps. Um, We we don't really know what effect his presence had in the QB room on Jalen Hurts, but uh, maybe minimal. I mean, (laughs) let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Yeah. I mean, Jalen spoke highly of him, but who knows? Um, But it's interesting. I mean, Jalen, over the last week, you think about the Eagles have traded away in in the span of a week, a guy who was a Super Bowl MVP and a guy who caught the game-winning touchdown in the Super Bowl. Um, (laughs) I didn't think of that. That's true. um, So, you know, Jalen's had a veteran tight end that he, I think he really did think highly of Zach Ertz. And then his backup both traded away in the span of a week. But um Stock up on the draft picks and hope someone else is making those picks when they when they show up. <laughs> yeah, really. So I did want to get into Gardner Minshew being the backup because with Joe Flacco as the backup, in my estimation, he was kind of like a, a buffer, right? No one's going to call for Joe Flacco. Even right. if Jalen Hurts is really bad, what do you gain out of playing Joe Flacco? We want Joe. Yeah, you weren't going to hear those chants. Maybe but, from Audubon, maybe from some sec- sections of uh, Colonial Conference territory. Maybe. But with Gardner Minshew as the backup, I think there's some validity to the idea that we might see him at some point this year if things don't get better. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, it really changes the dynamic. Um, fans didn't really – Fans were indifferent to Joe Flacco. I mean, he's what thirty six. Nobody's you know, nobody's going to be. But Minshew is a guy who, and is also a little more stylistically like like Jalen. But he's a guy who has played at a high level uh, recently. 
even though the wins and losses didn't show it. Um, I mean, he was playing for a terrible team. Um, he played well when he when he did play in Jacksonville, and he the magic he, ran out eventually. It did. Um, he's a younger guy, and um, you know he's he's kind of a personality, a little bit more of a personality than uh, than Joe Flacco, who's just kind of a boring old former Raven. Um, so I think there's more of a draw there. There's more of an appeal to fans. Um, you know, he's he's got a little swagger to him. I mean, she has got a little little juice. Um, so yeah, I would expect that if, um, if things don't get better, you're going to hear that. And I think you might hear it fairly soon. And I, again, I don't, yeah, yeah I, I don't, I don't think anything's imminent. I don't think, I mean, I think Jalen would have to be really bad for, for Nick to make a change. Um, uh, like, like Tampa bad. I mean, like you look at like the, um, who do they just play the Raiders? Um, like that's not going to get them benched, you know, missing a couple guys mm-hmm. uneven um, finish strong garbage time. I don't think that would get a bench, but I think if a couple games like Tampa might uh, maybe it might take two or three in a row, um, but it would mean the decision has been made that he's not the guy. So, I mean, I think that's gotta be an organizational thing that, you know what we've seen enough. I think 10 starts at a minimum, you have to see Jalen Hurst for at least 10 starts. Personally, I'd like to see him the whole year. Honestly, I, you know, um, I think you kind of need, need to, I mean, 10, 10, you know, 10 starts to Do me. Do you need like, to see him the whole year? I I, I would want to. Yeah. I guess I, I get to. that. I guess that you would want really, to. If he's really bad, he's regressing the accuracy. And we, you know, we've seen his completion percentage start dropping. There's your regression of the mean, maybe. Um, I mean, I think if he puts a string of three bad games together, um, it's something you think about. Um, I personally, I don't see any value in playing Gardner Minshew now. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't see it now. You think about it like one of those two guys is going to be their starter next year because I don't think there's anybody in the draft that could come in and start and start. I don't think there's an end of, you know an opening day ready quarterback out there. I uh, could be wrong and we'll, you know, we'll see what happens, but. Um, they could try and, to, to trade for a big fish. But like, like, I mean, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson and Aaron Rodgers are coming here. I mean, so I don't know who else, you know, would even possibly be available. Uh, I, you know, who, I mean, you really yeah, want I mean, like, there, there are some lower level options uh, who would be, probably be better in the short term people aren't gonna like this but like a kirk cousins level player who's good good player yeah. better than probably what they have right now i don't know but i think that i want to get i want to get i want to get back to the, the point though i don't want to talk about kirk cousins i want to get back to the point of you know if if the eagles continue to lose and jalen's not playing well at a certain point would nick start to think about his own job like, at a certain point, does he have to say, I can coach. I'm being held back by this quarterback. I need to show I can coach a different quarterback. I might get fired. Yeah, I think if he's playing that bad that he's thinking that way, then then that's that's going to be in the mix. Kirk Cousins is 33, by the way. Be 34 next year. I just – I don't see that, but, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to talk about Kirk Cousins. I just mean there, there are going to be some kind of options out there, there really, if they I mean, but there aren't like, like the best quarterbacks in football. Most of the good quarterbacks are older guys. I think you have to draft one. I would take those three picks and build, build a roster and start Minshew. If it's, if it's not going to be hurts and give him the season. But anyway, um, yeah, I think I think that's something to, to keep in mind. I mean, because there is a school of thought out there that you know Nick's play calling isn't really that bad. It's the execution and it's the quarterback missing guys and taking off and running uh, too quickly and not going through his progressions. And these these are the things that we all see. And then the other school of thought is the coach just isn't doing anything for the quarterback. So yeah. so one's holding one back, and we don't know which one it is. So if you remove one variable you get a chance to have kind of experiment. And we, if we don't think Sirianni is going to get fired midstream, which would be really out of character for this organization 
other than firing a jerk and Chip Kelly, then the only chance you have to find out would be to change quarterbacks at some point. And this is assuming, not assuming, but this is saying things have gotten pretty bad. Yeah. Um, I mean, they could both be holding each other back. I mean, they, my guess is that they're both part of the problem. And it's just a matter of kind of diagnosing exactly how much. Um, but if they can't work together, right. then you have to choose one. Right. But it's been seven games, so I'm not ready to go there yet. Um, I want a minimum of 10 games, and, and then I'll have kind of, I guess, a better sense of exactly what I think should happen next. Sure. And that's fair. And I'm, I'm not saying that – I'm not even saying I'd bench Jalen Hurts. The only but thing I'm you- saying is having Gardner Minshew as the backup opens the door a little bit. Yeah. And – but again, if you make that call, then you're moving on from Jalen Hurts. I mean, you, you don't you don't go back there. You don't you know try to reinvent him next year. You don't have open competition um, because if you're saying we know in ten games or twelve or eight, whatever it is, then you know if you're not giving him the whole seventeen weeks because you want to play Gardner Minshew, then I, so if I, you're changing, you can't go back. Is that what you're saying? So even right. if it's like a a halftime, I'm going theoretical here, halftime benching, they're playing the Giants in, in week uh, 12. Week they're playing the Giants in week 12. They're losing. Hurst is playing terrible. He puts Minshew on a halftime. Could he go back to Hurts next week? I mean, Big Red did that with Donovan in Baltimore, and we brought Kevin Cobb in, but um... – Gosh, that was two. That was Donovan's tenth year, so that was a little different. And he made it clear right after the game, he was like Donovan's still our quarterback. It's a little different with a young guy. Um, you start getting into that, you know. And then if Minshew plays well, um, you know, then you have to then 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 just all hell breaks loose with the quarterback controversy. Every press conference, every week, every that's all anyone's asking. You know, Jalen, are you, you know, you're looking over your shoulder, Nick, will, you know, you, who's your quarterback the rest of the year? You know, it just, I, We've I think. We've never seen that in this city, have we? That's the last thing this whole, this whole team needs. They need stability. They don't need some, a big giant quarterback distraction. He which wins. Is probably why, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true he too. Wins, they need better quarterback play. Thomas. But I think, I think, I think if you make the, if you make that change, I think it's pretty much permanent. But we'll see. Hey, at Nissan, we just made your choice for a new car, an easier one than ever, with our most exciting and fuel-efficient lineup. The choice is yours, so get great offers across our full line. Shop your local Nissan store today at NissanUSA.com. So, Rube, the Eagles have traded Joe Flacco, they've traded Zach Ertz, and they're not sellers, according to Howie Roseman, but they might be sellers, and they should at least uh, listen to offers for – just about anyone on this roster. And I came up with a list of five guys who I think they should at least be interested in trading. I'll go through them. You can tell me what you think about these names and then tell me if I missed anyone. The first one is the most obvious, Andre Dillard. There are some hurdles here. You know, it, Lane Johnson got his ankle stepped on. He, he missed the end of the game. Jordan Mailata is still dealing with a knee injury. So, You got to see if those guys are healthy because you might need Andre Dillard to start, you know, pretty soon and and for a few weeks or whatever it is. But if they're healthy and a team offers you a third round pick for Andre Dillard, you probably have to take it. Yeah. And even if they're not healthy, you you take the pick. If you can get a a three, which I still don't think they can get, I think a four is about the max you could get. But if they even get a four, I don't care if Malata and Lane are both on IR. You take that pick and you cobble together an O-line. Yeah, I I guess my problem with the four is you still have Dillard next year, and he's at least proven to be a competent backup. Is that worth a four? I don't know. That's worth a four because, I mean, Andre Dillard's growing trees. You can find a guy who can be a backup tackle. All right. I mean, the last competent backup tackle the Eagles had ended up getting a $40 million contract. So I don't know if if they grow on trees. Yeah, well, I mean, that was kind of an outlier. Um, I still don't understand that contract. I guess we'll see him next week. Um, But, uh, yeah, he's talking about Big V. But, um, 
yeah, I, I think it's too much of an opportunity, too much of a, um, you're trying to build this, rebuild this roster, this roster, you need talent, you need draft picks. You got to start building something here. Um, I would take, I would take a four for Dillard and, and I would, I would take that pick. And then I would worry about who my five offensive linemen are going to be. I'd, I'd find two tackles, Driscoll and the Raven Clark. I get that. And the, uh, the other thing is I, I know when Lane was out and we were watching Dillard on the left side, my lotto on the right, there was this thought, well, maybe that's, maybe that's it for the future. But the problem is they're tied to lane financially. So yeah. if he's here, they, they can't move on. He has to be your right tackle. So, and my lot of stuff, you don't have a spot for Andre Dillard. So that, that's why I think he does make sense as a trade candidate. Yeah. And I think he will get traded. Do you? Okay. I do. Yeah. So I like that prediction. All right. Uh, the next one is Steve Nelson cornerback. He, he's played fairly well this year. Certainly, a big improvement from what they had last year. That signings worked. He's been cheap and he hasn't been, you know, great, but he's been adequate and he's, he's a decent corner. I think that if there's a team out there willing to trade something for him, maybe the Eagles would do it. Now they don't have a ton of depth there. They have Zach McPherson. They have Tay Gowan, who they just traded for. They have Josiah Scott, who's a, a nickel. They might have to move Avante outside. They might have to, maybe start Zach McPherson. But if they lose to Detroit, Rube, then that, <laughs> then trade everyone. Yeah, if they lose to Detroit, it's on. Um, I don't want to move Maddox out of the slot unless it's absolutely positively mandatory just because he's he's one of the few guys on the team playing really well. And I mean, we were saying that even before he had that, that nice pick down in the red zone um, the other day. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing a little more Zach McPherson. I'm not sure he's ready, but if, if you lose to Detroit and you're sitting there at two and six, who cares? Um, you would take the pick. I'm, what do you think you get for Steve Nelson if, if it comes to that? Um, Four or five? Probably be a, probably be a five. Five? Maybe yeah. a conditional five. But, um, yeah, you would take that in a second. Again, I, would, I don't even know who the other three are, and I would, I would take them. <laughs> uh, the next one is Anthony Harris, who I don't think has played very well, but he's also playing 40 yards <laughs> behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, he's injured right now, but the injuries don't seem very serious. He has two thumb injuries and a groin injury. Uh, so he's day to day, but I don't think those are injuries that would really prevent a trade. And he's on a one year deal. A guy on a one year deal. If you get something for him, you get something for him. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to imagine anyone giving up anything for him. I don't think that's going to happen. You don't think so? No, because you, you give up. Even if you give up a seven, you're getting this guy for ten weeks, yeah. and he's not that good. I don't, Did I'll you think someone would trade for Joe Flacco a few years ago? I mean, I think quarterbacks are different. Okay. Um, you know, I think yeah, like if you, I mean, you got to have a. And by the way, the Jets shouldn't have what are they doing right well that's that's true too and they're, they're the jets that's why they've always been the jets that's why they always will remain the jets yeah the next uh, two are pipe dreams for different reasons uh derek barnett because he gets paid a lot of money he clearly hasn't played very well but he in previous years he's proven to be an average player if there's a team out there that really like, he's a former first round pick and those guys generally get more chances. And if there's a team out there that liked him coming out of Tennessee in 2017, maybe they take a chance on him. A team that says, Hey, we just need one more pass rusher, a rotational guy, not a starter, but like a rotational edge rusher. Maybe the Eagles could dump him on someone. Yeah. And that would open it up for, you know, Ryan Kerrigan to get those additional snaps that he has earned. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I would take anything for Derek Barnett. Again, it's kind of like the Dillard thing. You don't want to be embarrassed, but, you know, that was five drafts ago. Uh, and you're going to lose them after this year anyway. Well, you're not going to lose them. You're going to get rid of them. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not like he's leaving. I mean, you're like, goodbye. We don't want you. Um, yeah, I would take whatever I can get. But again, you know, it, it's a rental player. So I'm not sure you know, what you get for him. Yeah. And the last one, if you would thought you, that would, was, would you take a six? Would you take a, a six? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's also salary. 
Yeah. Um, the last one, if you thought Barnett was a pipe dream, Ryan Kerrigan. Now, here's my cell, if I'm Howie Roseman. Here's my cell. Let, listen to it. Ready? He's clearly out of position in this defense. That's why his snaps have decreased. It's not the lack of production. The lack of production is because he's out of position in this defense. Look at what he did last year. This is a guy who was on a Hall of Fame track, had five and a half sacks as a rotational player for Washington last year, had five and a half sacks the year before. He proved that in the right situation, he can still be a situational pass rusher. Will you please trade me for him? <laughs> That's Dave channeling his inner Howie right there. That was pretty good. What do you think? Um, I think you got to get the voice a little higher pitched, a little more, a little more <laughs> nasally. And then, you know, and then I think you'll be onto something. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he looked really good on that one tackle he made this year. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, no. Would you take a two for him? <laughs> like a $2 bill? I mean, you know what? You could trade Ryan Kerrigan for a conditional seven. And like, if he makes the Pro Bowl, you get a seven. If he doesn't, you don't get anything. And I would Wait. do it. Yeah. I would do it. Anyone else I missed? Now, there, there are some big guys I didn't list. Uh, you know, Fletcher Cox, Darius Slay. Those are the big names I think people want to get moved. I don't see that happening. Maybe. Someone blows you away for, for one of those guys. Everything's on the table. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. And, and Fletcher so is weird. one that's interesting now because he's clearly unhappy in this scheme, but the financials are tough there. Yeah. The financials make it really tough. And honestly, I don't think he's playing very well. And I think teams understand that. I'm not saying he's not playing out of position, but um, I, look, this goes back before this year too. I mean, he just, he wasn't the same player last year. He's in his thirties. Now he's played a lot of ball in his career. He's in what year, um, year 10. Um I, I don't think people are going to be lining up for Fletcher Cox. Like the name Fletcher Cox, but the player, um, I just I don't see it. Especially and how about with... Slay. The problem is he's the, he might be their best defensive player aside from Hargrave. Yeah, um, maybe including Hargrave. Yeah, maybe including Hargrave. Um, I think he's I think he's more likely than Fletch, but yeah, I'm just not. Yeah, I don't know. I'd hate to see him go. Um, if You're really go. tanking this season if you trade Darius Slay. Yeah, yeah. If you trade Darius Slay, you got to you have to fire the coach. <laughs> like we're starting over here. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I'd be I'd be really surprised to see that. Anyone I'd else I miss? No, I don't think so. I think Dillard's likely. I would even say you know likely or probable. Um, if Brandon think, Brooks was healthy, he'd be on this list. Definitely. I mean, they they we're kind of shopping him around already. Um, Steve Nelson would be second on that list for me. I think he's got some value. I think that's, um, you know, the only thing that might dissuade them is just how little they have at the position. Yeah. Um, but you know what, if you're sitting there two, two and six, and again, the, the trade deadline is what November 3rd. So this will be the final game before that you're sitting there at two and six, you know, Steve, thank you. But you know, We'll take this sixth round pick, fifth round pick. And if he goes to a contender, I don't think he's going to be very upset about it. I think if he goes anywhere, he won't be upset. And again, this is, you know, when you build a team through a lot of free agents, they don't, they don't have, like you watch Zach Ertz when he got traded. I mean, he's like, I'm going to wear my Eagles wristbands and he's crying and he's taking out ads. You sign a free agent. Steve Nelson doesn't care. He's got no connection to Philadelphia. He's been here for a couple months. Anthony Harris, you know, Ryan Kerrigan, um, all these guys. It, and, and that's why you have to build. I mean, it's one of the reasons you have to build for the, through the draft. There's a lot of other ones. Um, but, you know, to, to have that total buy-in to the program and the franchise, you know, you want guys that grow up together and, and build together and, um, so those are the guys you want to keep uh, and those are the guys who want to be here Steve Nelson like he'd be packed so quick <laughs> like hey Steve well we were just talking to uh, you know the 
Uh, we were just talking to the Seahawks and bye. You know, so yeah, uh, but it'll, it'll be interesting. Uh, should be should be interesting day Tuesday. Yeah, trade deadline next Tuesday should be a fun one. All right, that's that's all we have today. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate and subscribe Hello. wherever you get your pods. If you're listening on YouTube, please click like and subscribe there as well. What? I just want to I want to see Jordan Howard play Sunday. I think you're going to. Yeah, he hasn't played in a year and a half since he got hurt in 19. Had a couple of snaps here and there, but um, I think he should be uh, he should be the guy as long as Miles is out. Yeah. Okay. That was a weird thing to toss into the end of this podcast. We'll talk about I, that I, in, in I a couple of days. Meaning to say that. Anyway, yeah. All right. Take care, guys. We'll talk to you soon.